whether or not prime minister modi's government programs and schemes are secular enough ki dekho politics apni jagah hai and hone do but administration is something else there is no discrimination you know this whole narrative of this is a majoritarian uh, government and they don't care about minority community is absolutely not true we are restoring the dignity of uh, the most vulnerable segments of the society now you do not have to stand in lines you do not have to beg uh, there is no middleman how evidence based is decision making at the very top there is a lot of input going into decision making which is based on data sarkar sab vote karte hain a rich person has a vote a poor person also has a vote the narrative which gets spun is by the elite this is a government which is also responding to the basic needs and the expectations of the poorest part of the uh, electorate jab wo sarkar vote karte hain power mein to unki expectation hoti hai ki bhai you will give me pani milega bijli milegi uh, naukri milegi mere paas you know i'll have good schools health care etc and these are the kind of things that governments are meant to provide the democratic dna is uh, the roots are very deep there is really nothing to uh, uh, worry and therefore the fake narratives uh, are not only fake but they get called out very easily yeah. by just talking to people and looking at this data and 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 sort of showing a mirror to objective truth <laughs> Welcome to the NIJ podcast with Ananya. I am your host Dr. Ananya Avasti and today we have a distinguished guest joining us Dr. Shamika Ravi. Dr. Ravi trained as an economist is the member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and also the secretary to the government of India. Previously leading the research vertical at Brookings India Dr. Ravi specializes in economics of development including areas like finance, healthcare, gender equality, welfare and even poverty reduction. So in this episode we dive deep into key developmental issues facing the country unbundle macro economics of india in simple and easy to understand terms and also gain valuable perspectives from dr ravi's vast experience on what does india's growth story look like so let's unravel the world of economics which i don't know much about and development and data with dr shamika ravi thank you so much dr ravi for joining us for our fourth episode my pleasure i am again nervous since you're an economist you're a phd in economics i'm sorry about it yes <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so i've had to do a lot of homework with the questions that we have for this episode and i and i hope uh, that we do get simple answers right. to difficult questions <laughs> all right okay so the first question whenever we think about uh, shamika ravi we think about data what does it feel like like what is data to you in your head and why do you think it's so important you know data is like uh, crude oil mm. right you often hear people say data is a new oil but ah. it's really crude oil it's ah. not of much use ah. if uh, you don't have the capacity to analyze it and transform it to something useful right mm. so it's a lot of noise and to analyze it is to then transform data into information right. and that excites me uh, the reason being you know data is relatively more objective mm. and it gives you a realistic picture of how things stand mm. compared to everything else which is anecdotal no mm. something you say somebody else says kisi ne kuch kaha kisi ne kuch kaha par so one anecdote can be offset by another anecdote mm. so data is more systematic it's uh, more objective right and for economics it's very important right 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 uh talking of economics i was reading up your bio and it's very inspiring you started out you graduated from lsr i did yes um and in then 96 in 96 yes. wow and then what what what's been your journey like um you know from an undergrad in economics to now actually using data to inform the economic policy what what does it feel like you know lsr as an institution um i must say was very important uh, in uh, instilling some degree of interest in the topic mm. uh, because also as an institution it was a bit different from other colleges at that point because even in 95 mm. uh, you know in the final year we actually wrote a paper okay. i'm not sure people used to write papers then or colleges right yeah. back then but uh, we did have some faculty members 
and so i remember even then we had done a paper comparing india and china oh okay. and uh, mm. so and you know we would go to the jnu library and print everything in the bubble jet mm. which would take hours but it was an exciting time to do uh, something and after that delhi school provided uh, a serious um, sort of a view of what a researcher's life looks like and what is research and how do you actually uh, work with policy and so on uh, but i must confess that i actually fell in love with the subject only during my phd years okay. which uh, was where which was in new york university oh, wow. and um, i mean of course i have been following your work uh, and you were leading the research vertical at uh, brookings and now at the prime minister's economic advisory council so how does it feel like from hardcore data crunching to looking at you know how this data can help inform economic policy how does this transition look like i think the work is the same ananya i feel like i've been doing the same and the similar type of work in the last 25 years but what i have grown personally um, as a researcher uh is i think my understanding of institutions has gotten better with time mm. because what happens is that you know when you do academic research we think of an idea we test it yeah. and then we publish it and that for us is the end of uh, that okay interest okay uh, uh, right but then that is read by a handful of reviewers and um, the measure of impact is who then uses it and cites it but you know in india because we have so few researchers doing the kind of work which actively feeds into policy making on a real time basis mm. i think the marginal value of the research that you do in india on indian issues using indian data mm. and with indian institutions i think is is far more valuable uh, or has been i can say this for my own personal journey than being an economist who looks at um, you know develop market problems because my training was in the us uh, and i was surrounded all my peers were doing that kind of work uh, but i think when i moved back uh, to india very quickly that realization dawned that i have to look at local problems and local mm. solutions so the motivations are very real you have to just step out and uh, go for a walk mm. and you see what the problems are right when you spoke about uh, use of indian data yeah could you elaborate more we uh, have had the basic data architecture we have one of the oldest and the most robust systems of data collection we've had it now for 70 years uh however we are also now moving into the realm of precision policy making so all india data is not of that much value i would say when it comes to handling matters of healthcare mm. and let me just give you an example like you know the leading cause of death for women in up is diarrheal death one of the leading causes is diarrheal death ab uske liye the kind of you know the institutions that you have to set like the public uh, health infrastructure that you have to put in place is very different than what you would have to do in a place like kerala where the leading cause of death for women is cardiovascular ailment mm. ab hain to sab jagah district hospitals mm. they are all public health right but they are meant to be very different because they cater to local needs and local pressures and burdens so local level policy making and i am of course telling you about a district but india mein district ka what is the average size 2 million right so our districts are very large in themselves mm. and i think that is where now data is informing day to day policy making at a highly localized level so it has become a very interesting space to contribute i think for researchers right talking about data i mean from your bio i read up that your research focuses on i mean very very uh, different uh, areas and aspects including finance healthcare urbanization gender equality welfare and poverty reduction what's your favorite area of inquiry as a researcher they are all connected ha huh. they are applications of development economics or empirical knowledge of data analysis into different sectors of the economy so they are all part of development economics financial inclusion or development finance which has a lot to do with microfinance now it has to do with of course the government getting in such big ways whether it's pmjdy ayushman bharat whatever they are all very closely linked with gender because a lot of microfinance was on gender so you're gradually moving towards from one to the other a lot of healthcare in fact one of the leading causes of impoverishment in india is health expense 
Right. So then how do you design financial instruments to be able to support households at the bottom two quintiles, which are the most vulnerable? So, you know, development um, work or the economics of development, these sectors are all very interlinked. Not watertight compartments, no, yes. No, And I think as younger researchers, that is how we used to attempt answering, you know, there were marginal equilibria you were interested in. There were marginal impacts of certain schemes and policies. But then as you get older, you also, and that's where I'm saying that the knowledge of institutions and how, um, you know, also across sectors, like the government and the private sector, civil society, how they all contribute. So I think as you get older, you begin to appreciate institutions more in designing policies, in measuring impact of certain policies. And I think that is the big change uh, personally for me. And then of course, you know, there are a lot of public social media narratives around um, policy and decision making. So very straight up question, how evidence based is decision making at the very top? As much as possible. Because remember, the kind of data that is required uh, or the kind of input that is required for an executive to make a decision uh, is not always sufficient. Sometimes it is also a leap of faith, uh, which is where I think to the best of our knowledge and capability, you try to use data because I seriously think data is as objective as one can get. But of course, part of my job is also to continue to highlight okay, this is what the data is saying, but this is a data limited in its, mm. uh, 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 you know, Scope the way it was collected or what was the intent, mm. uh, how uh, is the sampling a problem, so how can you generalize from this. So that kind of input, when we give an input to the chief executive, then it comes with the caveats. Uh, the final decision, of course, is for the leader to make. But uh, you put in uh, as much evidence as possible. So I think evidence basing now, by the way, not just at the national level, but state after state, uh, you are seeing that uh, there is a lot of input going into decision making, which is based on data. Uh, we have a lot of bodies. In fact, you know, almost all our central schemes also have this 5% uh, 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 allocation for measuring impact of the scheme. Right, right. Uh, so we are meant, we are supposed to, we don't always do it. And I think that is why it's a work in progress that we also have to create the bench strength, institutional power and, you know, get people who are continuously evaluating and giving that kind of feedback to the system. So the feedback loop, uh, some of it can be anecdotal. Uh, a lot of it is, is meant to be data and, you know, empirical in nature. So decision making, I would think increasingly has become more and more uh, data heavy. Right, right. Um, talking of data, and uh, of course, I have a public health background. So, mm. talking about COVID nineteen, right? Almost the elephant in the room. Um, tell us uh, objectively and through the lens of data, how did India? And thankfully, now we are hopefully in a post COVID era. Um, how do you see? You know, India faring as far as the welfare perspective goes right. and also what does the final picture look like in terms of how well did we indeed end up managing or fighting the pandemic so both public health perspective as well as welfare perspective well i'll tell you when the pandemic struck uh, many people were expecting uh, developing countries mm. and that to emerging markets which have such large population uh, like India, people expected hunger deaths. Mm. People expected um, disaster, humanitarian disasters. The fact that it's been long enough and we have not had hunger deaths, the fact that our inflation was under control, the fact that we ramped up homegrown manufactured vaccines, again, within a very short period of time, the fact that we were able to put up the kind of digital platforms which enabled distribution of welfare, again, real time. It uh, enabled distribution of vaccine, real time again, massive, massive populations. All of these things put together tell you uh, that we came out of it looking good. We actually managed things quite well, despite tremendous pressure, right? Domestic as well as global. 
Remember, this was also the time when there is global uncertainty on pandemic itself, of course, uh, dealt a huge blow. But there's also the trade war. The U.S.-China trade war had started. There was a great deal of churn, mm -hmm. even in terms of the value chain. Uh, and and uh, um, it was a difficult time. But I think uh, leadership, again, has a very significant role to play. I think most of our institutions uh, did uh, rise up to the occasion. On a hindsight, one always thinks of, well, perhaps we could have done this. Mm. We should have done this In too. In retrospective. In retrospect, mm. it's always like yeah. that, right? Uh, but the fact that we were able to achieve uh, economic stability, uh, as well as control the pandemic and the spread of uh, the virus itself. You know, and of course, one of the big step was the lockdown. We came under heavy criticism because of the lockdown. But unlike Europe or the US, we didn't lift the lockdown immediately. We had a very slow period of unlocking. All of those in hindsight was absolutely the right thing to do because it slowed down the pandemic or the spread of the uh, vaccine, uh, the virus. And it gave us time to, first of all, design and implement these kind of humanitarian aid, like food grain, cash dispersal, all of that was happening again in a real time. People are going back to their hometowns. When they're getting off the train, they're getting the cash. So the DBT was ramped up again um, overnight. Uh, on a hindsight, I think India's story of how we manage the pandemic is a, is a real success story. We should be very proud of it. Right, right. What about, um, again, some of these are clubbed as conspiracy theories and then, you know, one needs data to dispel certain doubts or misconceptions. What about excess deaths under COVID? Because I think quite a few newspapers did report on that. But what is your data-based response on COVID-19 excess deaths? You know, again, the reality check is our data systems uh, and particularly registration of birth and death uh, the way it has it is structured, it is still a work in progress. Not all the deaths in India are registered. First of all, it's important to understand that many deaths go unaccounted. Now, think of uh, rural areas. Think of babies, like kids under five, etc. There are no pecuniary, there are no financial uh, uh, reasons for registration. So the households aren't exactly going out and registering a lot of this, right? So. If you look at the way excess deaths were measured globally, even by the WHO study, etc., which came under huge criticism from many countries, they basically looked at the trend before the pandemic of what were the annual deaths, and then they compared it with the death after one year, let's say a year and a half of the pandemic, and the difference between that is termed as excess death. Now, think of countries like Sweden and Germany, smaller countries far, far richer than us which have very robust CRVS system, which is civil registration of vital statistics. They are measuring all of this. They have it registered. They all objected to the WHO study. In fact, the WHO study had to retract a lot of the uh, findings for several of these countries. Uh, for them to try and attempt this kind of an exercise for India, where we do not have a CRVS system is something we are working on. Death registration is not um, 100%. Universalized, In fact, yeah. it also it varies systematically. So it's like saying if I looked at Delhi's data and I try to extrapolate from there, then, you know, the way things are structured, if 100 people have actually died in Delhi, the registration is of 260. Why is that? Because the hospitals, a lot of the infrastructure is in Delhi. Yeah. So people from the neighborhood, excuse me, are coming to Delhi to get Aid, right? and, uh, yes, and of course, many unfortunately will die. Mm. So if you look at registration from some areas, it's like looking for the needle under the street light. Right. Uh, right. And uh, clearly it is a very faulty method. Mm. Uh, and so people came up with all kinds of outrages. And then, uh, you know, we had to educate. We had to ed educate a lot of experts. In, in, you know, in terms of what Indian data system look like. It's, it continues to be a work in progress. But I think um, the pandemic, of course, has uh, uh, expedited now a lot of the birth and death registrations, etc., that are happening across. Uh, but at the time, we didn't have uh, the, process, you know, the wherewithal to actually do this kind of an analysis. So it was, uh, I think, um, naive on behalf of the folks who did it.
that's number one. Uh, it was also early, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, it's an evolving uh, problem. And to come and uh, sort of put a, a, a number that too, which is extrapolated, uh, you, they made all kinds of uh, assumptions uh, across states for registration. So the, there were huge problems with uh, the way it was done. And hence, uh, as researchers, as scholars who work on these areas, we push back. Uh, and uh, it was a huge uh, sort of a educational, uh, uh, sort of an attempt yeah. to tell people of what situation in India is vis-a-vis -vis the data. But also remember, we are, you know, the expectation from a lot of researchers globally mm. was suddenly they wanted data from a system which had not, yeah. which doesn't have this kind of data. So it is also unrealistic. Uh, now, of course, we should have the data. So that is why CRVS is now uh, being attempted. There's a very serious attempt to register all births and deaths across the country. Right, right. So coming back to the economy, um, how did India fare as an economy? I mean, it's obvious that India has been more resilient than other economies, a lot of economies which almost seem to be on the brink of, you know, high in inflation and so on and so forth. Look at the neighborhood. Right, right. Right, country after country around us. Yes. Very. Because of the pandemic. It's happening now, but but uh, the trigger was the pandemic. So so then what was different or what was differently done in India uh, that could possibly be attributed to why we seem to be floating in a much more comfortable I think we didn't get swayed. We didn't um, easily give in to uh, the global pressure. There was also, I must say, there was also domestic pressure uh, to pump money uh, as fiscal stimulus. And you've seen that in most of the OECD countries. Uh, high inflation, which they are still uh, uh, worried about, was an account of the fact that a lot of money was pumped to offset uh, the downturn on account of the pandemic. We didn't do that. And I think uh, it's a pragmatic approach. We are a $2,200 per capita per year economy. Uh, to mimic an OECD country, that itself, uh, uh, you know, is not the right approach. So I think a pragmatic approach meant that while we will, uh, we will have fiscal and monetary policies working in tandem, and you saw the series of announcements after that, uh, whether it was from the Prime Minister, whether it was from the Finance Minister, uh, there were a series of monetary policy announcements happen from the RBI, etc. There were all kinds of credit schemes at that point floated, uh, especially pertaining to MSMEs, uh, small entrepreneurs, and, and the kind of, you know, the markets had, their, you know, suddenly demand had crashed. So we, you know, we were uh, using all these different instruments to offset. While all along this is happening, your core focus was, humanitarian crisis aversion. So we wanted to make sure that food grains was available mm. to everyone. Uh, we wanted to make sure basic cash dispersal in the form of DBT was uh, available and, and simultaneously producing and distributing vaccines. Uh, that's when the second wave hit us, when the initial vaccination drive started. So, uh, and no one can predict by the way waves simply because you cannot predict mutations and you yeah. can't predict new uh, strains, etc. So, um, when second wave, we had some kind of recalibration, we stopped a lot of the exports uh, because nation comes first, your own citizens come first and you saw a huge ramp up. Uh, I think if you compare it to not just the neighborhood, uh, but many emerging markets which are actually far more affluent than us, think of Brazil, Think of South Africa. These are countries far richer than us. But today, they are all uh, at the juncture of missing their sustainable development goals on account of the pandemic. We, on the other hand, are actually well on our way to attaining these objectives. So it tells you that it has had long-term impacts because uh, we have, we've had a very pragmatic approach. We didn't get swayed. Mm -hmm. I think that, in essence, is what the approach was. Right, right. And what's been the role of RBI in all of this? How would you explain that? You know, it's important. Uh, people think of RBI as a, maybe because it's in, in Bombay, uh. people think of it as a separate entity. It's very much part of the government. It's very much an institution which is part of, you know, it's our central bank. Mm. So it is, uh, it is the apex frontier for managing all the monetary policy. 
and uh, for making sure that liquidity was not a problem, for making sure that um, uh, the kind of terms, the kind of renegotiations that were necessary for the banks to do, particularly uh, for the vulnerable MSMEs, all of that was done. Uh, and I think the RBI and the finance ministry worked beautifully together. Well. They worked yeah. together because the objective was common. Mm. Uh, there, there are two different instruments uh, of, uh, uh, of offsetting or overcoming these kind of downturns. And I think they worked really well together and the results are for all of us to see. Right. Uh, talking about uh, inflation, we get to hear that the price has increased. I was the other day looking at some interview um, where somebody at the World Economic Forum was saying that in so many years, know, this is the highest rate of inflation that the yes. country is facing. How do you respond to that? And especially, why don't you put this in global perspective for us in terms of what's really happening in the world and then where does India stand on it? So inflation, uh, first of all, it's important to understand that not all inflation is bad. For instance, when uh, the price of certain food items go up, it is also a transfer to the producers, which is to the farmers. Right? So there is... Inflation also has a distributional impact. That's first and foremost, it's very important to understand. And not make a hawa out of all inflation is bad. Nay, there is a redistribution within the economy, which is desirable. The second is, I think it's an account of the fact that we did not have major fiscal stimulus without a strategy. Uh, it did not translate into uh, out-of-control inflation, which again, you are seeing country after country, uh, uh, particularly the affluent, again, the OECD countries, uh, the US, uh, Europe, uh, they did have major, major stimulus, fiscal mm. stimulus. And I think it's on account of that that uh, they are continuing to reel under, uh, you know, inflationary pressures. Uh, of course, the war uh, in Europe, uh, you know, the Russia-Ukraine situation has made it worse. Uh, but for us, inflation is nowhere as much a concern. In fact, uh, if anything, it's uh, only gotten better, right? In the middle, there was some pressure, but again, I think it's eased uh, and it's very much under control now. Right. Uh, another uh, point, uh, which I'm sure audiences would like to know about as far as data and economy is concerned, mm. what does data say about the state of unemployment in the country? Yeah, unemployment, the job situation, right? Everyone is interested in it. There are some peculiarities of global jobs market, which the IMF, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's a euphemism, but they called it youth inactivity. So people under 30 uh, who ought to be ideally working, uh, they are less likely to be working under the current situation. This has been the case for now last 10 years or so. India also has that concern. We have youth unemployment, right? Uh, the other peculiarity of the situation is we also have something called graduate unemployment, which means the more educated you are, the less likely you are to be working, which makes no sense, right? Because I was going to ask you, what you does that mean? Younger, huh? Ananya, but I'll tell you, uh, at the time when we were in college, you were incentivized. You were basically told, look, you have to study hard uh, because when you study and you get a degree, then then you get a good job. Today, what is happening is that the data tells you that uh, the people, the population um, under 30, so 18 to 30, who have a graduate degree or above, so these are the most educated uh, segments in the labor market, are almost five times more likely to be unemployed compared to somebody who has a primary education or below. So it is not, uh, there, is a, there is first of all a dissonance between a degree and actual skill in the market. Because simultaneously, survey after survey is telling us that uh, today many firms will tell you that the constraint to our growth mm. is not finance. We can raise the capital. Mm. It's skilled manpower. Mm. So now, how are the two coexisting? Well, they coexist because the degree which has raised your expectation and the skill in the market which is getting rewarded, they're not always exactly the same. That is why you should appreciate why skill India. Mm. Why we need to do skilling at a very large scale, right? right. Uh, and there are different kinds of apprenticeship programs, the different kinds of schemes which are being implemented. But I think one thing to understand in the Indian economy is that India's states, you should think of India as vibrant, 28 vibrant state economies, right? 
systematically, the states which are growing economically are also the states where unemployment is very low, including youth unemployment. So clearly, you know, wealth creation is leading to job creation. This belief that the government will provide job to everyone, yes, government provides jobs, but it's not a robust business model. Uh, where the government is the largest employer or yeah. is continuing to employ very significant... Sarkari, Nokri ke balbute. Kahan se growth hai, yeah. right? And by the way, one of the uh, points which is constantly highlighted even in the Sri Lankan case today, mm -hmm. that it has a very high, almost 10 to 12% of the population is employed in the government. Mm -hmm. That's not sustainable. Right, right. It's not sustainable. So that model for growth is not uh, uh, what we want. And our own state data is telling us that all the states which are growing economically, mm. meaning they're creating wealth, are also creating jobs. They're creating jobs for men and women. They're creating jobs for young as well as the older population. So I think growth eventually is our pathway to job creation. Right. Makes sense. So walking down that road, what about women's labor force participation? Because I've read a little about why there may be some concerns in terms of the methodology right. that's been deployed, especially in, in the Indian context. So if you could throw light on that. So labor force participation of women, you know, when you look at conservative nations like South Korea, China, when I say conservative from a gender perspective, Japan, these countries we have seen that with economic growth, they have all actively worked on raising female labor force participation and they have succeeded. So with economic growth, more and more women have been participating in the job market. Now in the Indian case, what uh, we have seen is uh, uh, first there was this study or the ILO data which came out and said, oh, female labor force participation is declining. But the methodological issue there was the ILO itself actually published a paper. They came out with a fairly rigorous study and it's a pity they don't talk enough about it. Is that they came out with a metric of augmented labor force participation, which means many productive activities that women do, uh, if you treat it as productive activity, uh, then the labor force participation of women actually has been rising. Mm. It is looking far better than. So some of it is a definitional issue. Mm. But Ananya, beyond the definition and the data issue, there is something more fundamental and this is a difficult conversation which we have to have also as a society. That while women are getting more and more educated, right, they're going out and getting far more higher degrees uh, than ever, but we are a traditional society across states. We value family, we value children. Now, in an economy which is nuclearizing very fast, which is urbanizing very fast. The burden of child care and child sort of uh, bearing and rearing kids is disproportionately placed on the shoulder of the women. So this whole concept of care economy, mm. we need to now have a very serious conversation on it. That the entire burden of care, whether it is of children, the elderly, is falling on the household, uh, shoulders of the woman in the house. It's a productive activity. It is a valuable activity. It's not part of the GDP because there is no money transacted. It's mm. happening in the household. Right. So partly, I think it's a statistical process. We should put a value and try and gauge mm. how much contribution women in India are actually making to the economy and what is the value of all this effort that is going in. Uh, but a more realistic uh, sort of a response to this is we have to seriously work in expanding and improving care infrastructure. Creches should be easily available. They should be of high quality. We are thinking of institutions which are now going to replace the nani dadis, the, the, the larger joint families who would, you know, it took a village to raise a kid but no longer. Now it's a, it's a family, a, a mother and a father who are by themselves. And so... Um, uh, we have to now think of these difficult and uh, so that women actually have the freedom and they make a choice which is truly a choice. Right, right. Uh, you spoke about villages. I am referring to a study by People's Research on India's Consumer Economy and India's Citizen Environment Price, which noted that India will see a five-fold increase in its super-rich families by the turn of the decade, and that the big chunk of this growth comes from the rural areas. So in this context, 
what do you think have been the major initiatives that have been undertaken by the current government in both the terms um, that have possibly really pushed up the rural economy and um, if you could talk both from say an hdi human development perspective but also from a hardcore infrastructure perspective what do you think might be some of the causative factors behind this you know the rural economy for a long time um, it it had been neglected if you consider the fact that cities even today remain engines of growth globally but definitely uh, also true for india what you have seen in the last 10 years is a major push uh, towards improving rural infrastructure mm-hmm. right uh, improved connectivity improved financial access improved um, uh, if you consider uh, things like insurance so different specific instruments in the financial markets they have all been expanding very fast in the rural areas in fact the fmcg if you just look at the growth uh, year on year we get these numbers saying the rural markets are what uh, are leading uh, you know it led the recovery subsequently it has been leading so the rural market in india uh, has gotten stronger also because now we are trying to move away from the mere production side of things to strengthening storage distribution uh, processing side of things it is getting more mechanized uh, we have seen historic growth in production uh, in many states many states are diversifying so i think uh, uh, agriculture in india again has undergone um, sort of a second uh, revolution where now beyond production now we are going towards diversification into the kind of uh, grains and uh, pulses oil seeds etc which which was uh, which is bound to happen with time simply because tastes uh, are more evolved and developed so people's willingness to pay for these things is rising we are becoming a less poor and and a more affluent sort of a uh, market and the agriculture economy is responding to that mm. uh, we also have uh, growth of organic Uh, which is a very niche uh, there is a high willingness to pay uh, and uh, you are seeing the rural market really uh, blossom uh, you also saw that of course uh, global situations also meant uh, the demand for indian wheat uh, but these are like windfalls they happen you know th- there is not a growth model around yeah. it but these things happen and it's really good for uh, uh, you know the country but uh, rural economy definitely and of course the taxation structure is such that um, uh, we don't tax farmers and uh, that means that the real income uh, uh, that you need to earn in uh, urban areas post uh, taxation is far higher uh, for a quality of life uh, than what in rural areas you would have again because of the nature of the taxation etc so i think all put together uh, rural india is looking uh, far better far better than it has uh, for decades in the past um coming to the next question uh, we've heard the prime minister talk about uh, first order second order third order uh, effects and impacts of government program what does it mean unbundle that you know um, let me give you an example just to explain that when toilets were built you have to wonder why were toilets built first open defecation free right we kept talking about we should make india open defecation free uh, there were some uh, motivations from the health side of things that look if you make a place open defecation free then it impacts infant mortality when toilets more than 100 million toilets within a sh- very short span of time when they were built the empirical again when you start doing the research all these uh, uh, sort of new knowledge emerges mm-hmm. right one of the biggest impact was on uh, crime against women right uh, rapes uh, you know these are unintended consequences so the toilets were built uh, the building of the toilet itself like is like a first order effect saying okay uh, if there's a scheme going how many more people have access to toilets right, right. that's number one first order mm-hmm. the second order then becomes all these unintended consequences such as safety of women and safety of girls the third order then of course you extend the argument further to think of does it do anything to school education yes drop out of girls used to be high on account of not having clean toilets uh now you you know that that is a non problem uh similarly if you think of the lpg the fact that it has had very significant impact on women's indoor pollution and lung health which was associated these are all second order effects right mm. so the prime minister is now repeatedly 
talking about it because the research is repeatedly now showing scheme after scheme that uh, you know the impact of a large scheme is never the obvious uh, what you see by you know in the form of administrative data when you count how many people got a benefit or a amenity because it's transforming lives in very fundamental ways think of electrification the bottom 20 quintile which is the poorest segment of the society and hence the most vulnerable you now almost have universalization people have access to electricity it is such a fundamental source of energy that it is transforming lives and you know what we can compare ourselves with is is the 1940s when uh, this kind of massive electrification massive uh, pipe drinking water availability etc happened in the us mm. when you give this kind of amenities uh, it really becomes a pathway or an impetus for long term productivity enhancements and growth so that is the cusp at which we are and hence this whole conversation around saturation mm. that all basic amenities to all citizens everywhere across the country because this is a very important pathway for long term development and growth by saturation should i understand it maybe in in terms like roti kapda makan like is that the maslow's roti kapda makan except with a lot of dignity ha huh. we are restoring the dignity of uh, the most vulnerable segments of the society because now you do not have to stand in lines you do not have to beg uh there is no middleman the whole digitalization process and by the way you've heard um, the IMF talk about it you've heard the world bank you you've heard many other forum people talk about this big be- being a logistical marvel the kind of transformation that india has managed on the back of the core architecture which is digitalization etc is that the middleman or the whole you know the the system of uh, having people in the middle which was leading to leakages that is now out which means people are entitled and they get it right and that is what dignity is about that they don't have to stand in uh, line and uh, beg ji huzuri for weeks on end wo sab ab nahi hai and people you know dignity is a very uh, it's not something we measure mm-hmm. as economists it's but you can you can uh, you know there is an obvious philosophical uh, appeal to it right and you see voters reward that mm. how do you think this is different from a rights based approach you know entitlement a right based approach uh, think of like the nreg nreg which is a very fundamental it's an excellent scheme for a country like ours because one it overcomes the selection problem that whom do you target mm. all rural households mm. can work the point is there's a self selection i will only go there and till the land and do this heavy unskilled manual work if i value it right so obviously the it's it's available to all rural households but it's not the affluent or the better off it is only people who need it are hence going so there is always an appeal around uh, simple programs mm. the point though is that there are a lot of unintended consequences of these kind of schemes mm. of course during the pandemic it has uh, stood us really well nreg was uh, in many ways the backbone of welfare distribution uh happen when you've seen people go back from the western part of the country which is industrialized to the eastern part so employment guarantee was one of those mechanisms mm. but when it was launched um you should think of what did it do to small micro enterprises because effectively it was like implementation of a minimum wage across the country right. state after state which by the way also got political because state started promising higher wages that is where the politics entered but what it did do is that it made labor costly so while it is having impact on poverty and it is having good welfare impact there is a distributional consequence of this as well which is micro enterprises tiny enterprises which were hiring labor they had to shut down mm, those were killed they were killed right so it's never i mean you have to think of all the unintended consequences when you think of schemes going back to second order third yes. order Yeah. And uh, so there was there was a considerable amount of casualization of labor force because a lot of self employed like parchun shop a little yeah. horticulture pco booth ye sab band ho gaye because you just can't pay for that kind of rising labor wages so uh, uh, there is a difference uh, in making basic amenities available to all uh, because it's going in the form of uh, uh, basic input which helps raise productivity 
and human productivity, you know, in terms of human resources, people becoming uh, more productive. Mm. Uh, so amenities should be viewed, and that is why the U.S. example is a, a, a important one. Mm. In the 1940s, when the basic amenities were available in the U.S., mm. to uske decades of growth came mm. because it freed up, first of all, it freed women mm. uh, from uh, gathering uh, wood or, you know, collecting water. Uh, electrification meant that you didn't have to... Uh, uh, you know, the, the burning of the oil and staying up and so on. Uh, many, you could study longer, you could work longer. So some of these things, pipe drinking, water, so okay, it has huge impact on health. health yeah. It has huge impact on uh, uh, all other metrics of nutrition and health, uh, particularly for children, etc. So these amenities should be thought of as the, the core architecture of India's modern economy. And our future growth jo hai, uh, it is, in some ways, we are assuring uh, growth by raising everyone's productivity. Mm. On that point, through data, how do you respond to the narrative around whether or not Prime Minister Modi's government programs and schemes are secular enough? Mm. And uh, what has it done for the minorities in the country, particularly Muslims? Diku, uh one is the administrative data. And I think this is where you have to think of us while we work in the government. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not bureaucrats, right? I do not have to uh, uh, look at only administrative data to see that, uh, sabko bijli mil gaya ya sabko paani mil gaya. Yeah. There is a great deal of credibility in looking at survey data. So, uh, like the National Family Health Survey, NFHS does a very good job of uh, asking a very large sample. And so over six years period, we basically studied NFHS, four and five round. It includes around 12 lakh households, so 1.2 million, which is a very large sample. And it's self-reported, right? It's not government telling you, it is self-reported. The households are telling you. Mm. And the study is for the bottom uh, quintile, which means bottom, the most vulnerable 20% in the society. And you're seeing that there is no discrimination. You know, this whole narrative of this is a majoritarian uh, government and they don't care about minority communities is absolutely not true. And this is, in fact, data therefore becomes a very powerful tool to mm. counter a lot of these false narratives. Right. Dekho, politics is its own And hone do. But administration is something else. Local day-to-day -day governance, which is what, when you think of roots of democracy, right. it's in the day-to-day -day functioning of a government. Absolutely. That's what people vote governments for. Bilkul. And it's a very important point you made. Because the government votes all the time. A rich person has a vote, a poor person also has a vote. Mm -hmm. The narrative which gets spun is by the elite. Right. So you do not want, uh, you know, when you look at this kind of data, you're also basically saying that this is a government which is also responding to the basic needs and the expectations of the poorest part of the uh, electorate. Right. When the government votes in power, their expectation is that you will give me water, will get 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 you know, I'll have good schools, health care, etc. And these are the kind of things that governments are meant to provide. Hmm. And that you are seeing data after data. One is uh, no discrimination across minority and uh, uh, other population, particularly, in fact, in some areas, Muslims have actually marginally gained more, mm. right? Uh, if you look at social classes, social groups, SCSTs, OBC, etc., everybody is gaining. Uh, you can look at geographic clusters. Achha, geographic cluster ka kya relevance hai? That basically, it's a point that hume pata hota hai geographically ki that neighborhood yeah. is never going to vote for this party. Mm. But that does not, and so hence, if the administration were discriminatory, So it's in data. Absolutely, because it's easy, to, why, why take the pipeline all the way? Why take the electricity uh, cables all the way? But that's not happening. Right. You see, so administration is secular. Administration is non-discriminatory. Uh, and that is why I have such faith and optimism in, in, in Indian uh, story. Because our basic uh, institutions and our, dem you know, the democratic DNA is the, the roots are very deep. There is really nothing to uh, uh, worry. And therefore, the fake narratives uh, are not only fake, but they get called out very easily yeah. by just talking to people and looking at this data and, and, and sort of showing a mirror to objective truth. Right. Um, since you mentioned geographies as well, because we've covered 
um, socioeconomic groups, we've covered minorities in terms of government impact. Uh, now talking about state level impact, there was a paper that I was reading that you've recently done, um, which analyzes state level budgets right. in India. Right. So what is the top line view? What are the key takeaways? Um, and, and which states or which geographies do you think we need to focus more on as far as prioritizing development goes? You know, India, again, has, uh, a, you should think of each of these states as, you know, uh, robust economies in themselves. Ho kya hai ki electoral politics uh, is getting vitiated in a way that short-term electoral gains ke liye, aise aise scheme chalai ja rahi ya fir announcements kiye ja rahe, and policies being act kiye ja rahe, which are actually detrimental from a long-term perspective. Hmm. We cannot trade away our long-term growth for short-term electoral gains. I think that is, uh, in essence, what that whole analysis was about. And usme kya karte ki you don't look at ek do saal ka budget. Ye 30 year ka budget dekke, you're seeing a trend. Mm. Ki which are the states which have actually managed, uh, you know, efficient administration, jo ki uh, they have been able to uh, reform the way they spend and collect money. Mm. And so it becomes important to then study these different states. And usme wo sare rank order kiye hue by long term growth. Uh, you know, this is where I think it becomes important. Data really jumps out. Ki we actually have had a state jahan pe negative growth hua tha. Uh, which is? Dhas saal tak, mm. uh, which is uh, Bihar, mm. the poorest state in the country. Mm. And uh, the per capita GDP in Bihar in uh, 1990 and 2005 are identical. Okay. And this is the 15 years of the nation when the state, you know, the country is, uh, is growing really fast. Mm. And here is a state where it has completely stagnated. stagnated. In fact, it, uh, it was negative and then it caught up and then so it remained the same. You see, governance, um, local politics, it has a very direct impact on the economy. So mm -hmm. growth is not an abstract concept, theoretical concept. Nahi, ye, it's, a, it's a reality of, lived reality of people. So think of the poorest state stagnating. I think there can be nothing sadder than that. Uh, and hence, you know, it's important to talk about it and showcase that you cannot give in to populist uh, schemes and, you know, these kind of announcements because it basically destroys. Uh, and again, we have just stopped being poor, right? We as an economy, we have a long way to go to growth. Growth is uh, non-negotiable. We have to grow. Ah. We have still a long way to go. And... Uh, uh, electoral politics should not hold uh, the rest of, you know, the country hostage. So, in this uh, outcome variable which is important to look at is what kind of uh, investment or expenditure are states making towards capital outlay? Mm. Meaning, and that includes social and economic. Capital Bhai, outlay means? Capital outlay means aap, aap budget se, aap, how much money are you spending for long-term economic and social development? Mm. Achha, economic mein aata hai usme infrastructure, uh, rural, uh, usme industry, agriculture, irrigation, ye sab aapke, uh, economic infrastructure uh, mein aata hai, capital mm -hmm. development spending. Social mein aega health, water, uh, you know, education, etc. Welfare schemes bhi hai isme. Isme jab aap katauti karte hai, ya fir jab, uh, you know, you are not spending or you are declining the spend, future growth aayega kahan se? And this is where the states that uh, I do worry about and because the data is very clearly telling me is Bihar mein bohat kam hai. Right? But similarly, Bihar to hamesha se gareeb raha hai. So, uh, that is, you know, a sad story in its own way. But what is, I think, uh, equally sad is uh, a state which was not as poor. In fact, it used to be the richest state of the country, Punjab. Okay. There you are uh, seeing a, a big gap emerge. Mm -hmm. And now for a very long period of time, and increasingly so, their uh, investments, this kind of capital outlay is, uh, is declining. There's a huge gap between All India and Punjab. Mein kya ho hai. Similarly, West Bengal. Uh, you know, these are not affluent markets by, by any uh, measure. And jab in sub jago mein you are seeing a decline mm -hmm. in capital outlay. It's also telling me that long-term growth Kahan se aayega? It's not going to be able to. These states will not be able to grow. So where are the jobs going to come from? Right. Right. So uh, these are states, I think, uh, you know, the reason I get concerned is because it's a large country. 
your uh, growth process cannot be diverging uh, at this stage so much that uh, you know later on uh, these huge gaps emerge across states because that leads to its own kind of uh, problems right so you do want every state to realize its own potential there is no reason that uh, biharis are very smart they are very hard working mm-hmm. so uh, you know we have to demand ki uh, we need more investment into these kind of things same for punjab that we need some of the policies corrected mm-hmm. uh, west bengal i mean west bengal used to be a, a, a relatively well off state and for it not to invest into long term uh, growth is uh, you know it just tells you that the young and the educated are going to continue yeah and the political priorities are sort of way off the mark yeah no very clearly i mean probably good politics but bad economics uh, i think eventually um, uh, people do realize uh, but after all 2005 you saw a reversal in bihar Uh, but that happened after 15 years of lost opportunity so you don't wish that i mean you don't really want that for other states mm. talking about good politics and good economics what does amritkal really stand for so the term amritkal uh, the way i see it the way i uh, think of it it's really a strategy you see uh, india at 100 it means 2047 mm. so we have another uh, 25 years mm. right less or no <laughs> i was going to say that yeah but um this is the time frame within which we have to do everything that we can and develop all the different kinds of strategies across different sectors and states so that india becomes a developed nation from developing to a developed nation yes we okay. are an emerging market mm. uh, we are a major emerging market and our uh, growth continues to be one of the highest mm. uh and another interesting thing ananya which people often don't uh, appreciate ki dekho jab hum log 8 8 or 9 percent pe grow kar rahe the uh, which we think was great but that was around the time when many other economies were growing at 4 5 6 percent mm. mm. today we are growing uh, at 6 and a half when very few economies actually have positive growth rates right 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 so you have to think of india's growth the current situation also within the larger global context ki bhai samay mane mushkil waqt hai but we have a head above the water right and we have a um, long way to swim but uh, you know it's important to understand the context within which india's growth is looking particularly mm-hmm. uh, robust and uh, optimistic and why you are seeing you know one after the other institutions or countries mm-hmm. really vie for a, a piece of the action here right right and that is why the trade deals become very important that is why a lot of our bilateral uh, treaties uh, even beyond strategic treaties etc they are, you know i think it's important time for us to develop these partnerships because many countries are interested in us yep so to round that up i'm just quoting um, a news heading that i was that i looked up it said and this is recent this is latest it said with the banking sector upbeat and fresh private investments emerging india's economy is getting back on track foreign investors continue to find india attractive so what does the immediate growth forecast in india look like you know this is where i will put on my uh, hardcore microeconomist hat and tell you i don't do any forecasts or growth pre- predictions nahi. ha i am as a micro uh, economist who looks at sector level data etc i find uh, mujhe thoda sa ye voodoo wo lagta hai <laughs> kyunki you are throwing in many things we are looking good relative to everyone so i can compare the uh, numbers uh, exposed there is no obvious reason to believe uh, that you know unless there is a huge shock god forbid uh, we are over a pandemic uh, but forecast ke liye you know i mean i can always continue to look at the numbers which people have put out but i don't do a forecast so you will not see a number come from my office no my desk doesn't put out right. numbers yeah <laughs> because you know then this is this is the most asked question what I, does yes so that is where macro and micro people become are, different we are very different but, but um, building on that then Do you think we need to look at more holistic indicators mm. to track a country's yes. progress? Yes. Always. 
that is why I think GDP growth is a very narrow metric. It's an important metric mm. because, like I say, growth is not an abstract construct, right? It's not a theoretical construct. It's real. Hota. It's a lived experience for us. And for those of us who actually um, studied in India in the 1990s mm. when the economy opened up and there was a lot of action then, and we've seen the transformation in day-to-day -day living, mm. the food we get, the clothes we get to wear, you know, just equipments and things. Growth is very real. But growth, GDP growth is a very narrow metric, right? It's just money. Uh, we know that quality of life and livability uh, must uh, be expanded as a concept. And that is why the focus on human development index. Uh, may you, you know, we, are, uh, we have continued to be on that uh, growth path. Uh, though economically, we are around 25 years behind China. Uh, in terms of the HDI, the difference is only 10 years. Uh, and I think it's on account of the fact that we are a democracy, uh, basic amenities to everyone everywhere. So, development ke madhyam se agar aap dekhega, to we are actually doing far better, far better, far better than economic even, right? And that's a good story. I think it tells you that uh, democratic countries and that too robust, uh, jaisa hamara hai, it's a plural, noisy, but it's working because... Uh, we have managed to lower uh, some of the very difficult metrics, just say MMR, hota hai, IMR, hota hai, neonatal deaths. Hote hai. These are tricky uh, indicators. They take a lot of, it's not just money. Yeah. It's like reforming governance and on the ground reforming, uh, you know, the way um, uh, policy works and mm -hmm. is implemented. We are making tremendous strides, state after state. Mm -hmm. uh, food sufficiency, if you look at food production index, phenomenal. Our, we used to import 30% of what we ate uh, 40 years back. Today, it's less than 4%, right? Um, so we have, we have become, I mean, strategically, if you look at the how self-reliant are you? Not insular, mind you. How self-reliant? So not protectionism, but we are really developing our core strength. And I think it's the, it's the core muscle strength of the economy sector after sector. Um, you are seeing the big revolution happen in energy because we, we import a lot of our energy mm. and for a growing country like us, mm. we have to also, uh, you know, move away uh, yeah, towards the new reliance on external sources of external fuel. Sources. Therefore, we, we keep saying ki energy may be revolution. We need that kind of green revolution in energy, mm. which means persuading firms after firms, resident welfare association, meaning households, yeah. localities, by move towards renewable and uh, a more sustainable kind of sources of right. energy. So, um, sort of wrapping up to say that we are already, I think, the fifth largest economy. Um, and we will hopefully soon be moving only upwards. So, say 10 years from now, you spoke about India at 100 or right. probably even before that. What do you think would be, say, three or four big highlights or big decisions, economic decisions that have been made by this government that you think uh, have already possibly played a role or will play a big role in terms of, you know, making this growth story a reality? There are a few. I think one of the biggest uh, innovations and contribution mm -hmm. in the last 10 years of this government has been making a robust architecture for welfare distribution, which is all put together, if you think about it, Jandhan, Aadhaar and Mobile. Mm. You know, the jam trinity, which you've heard people talk about, the Prime Minister has been talking about for now 10 years. You know, that core architecture has allowed us to do real-time welfare in a very efficient way. We are able to target much better. And uska, the establishment of that itself is a miracle. Right. Therefore, people call it a logistical marvel, etc., etc. I think that is one of the biggest. Uh, beyond that, if you look at it, I think two of the other big, I mean, there is, of course, the toilet scheme, and there are many such uh, phenomenal uh, work that have happened, the focus on uh, uh, water access, electrification. These are the first order things, right? Mm -hmm. Basic. Uh, and the speed with which it has happened. So delivery has been uh, phenomenal. Therefore, you'll see, you know, the way voters actually continue uh, uh, to vote this government back. But I'll tell you, in my opinion, the very long-lasting impact, Jehoga, beyond welfare, mm. is health and education. Mein. 
you see uh, countries are built by people it's it's people we we need skilled healthy population we are a young population of course aging too so we have more than 120 million people above the age of 60 so wo care pe focus zaruri hai lekin i think the new education policy which has truly liberated the education front where we are allowing for experimentation ki wo one model fits all jo pehle ka system tha wo now we need to break away from that bring in skilling into the classroom allow for experimentation get industry into the classroom get kids into the shop floor get get experiential learning allow courses to be uh, 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 you know converted um, you know credit points to be uh, uh, you know from one institution to Transfer the other allow allow a lot of new things which is what the new economy requires right that is number one so i think new education policy is a very important aur dusra hai ayushman bharat mm. ayushman bharat ke do elements hai one is the welfare uh, the wellness centers jo ki primary health center hamara bhai ki when a person falls sick that first point of contact jo hai to a public health system is a good one you don't need to run to a super specialty hospital every time you get a fever you have a good nurse a good gp Uh, in the neighborhood mm. was strengthening of that system and and a lot of the wellness center in fact we have actually sur- surpassed our uh, uh, goals in terms of the numbers that had been set and so that's a are, good story how many are there now in the country you know we were likely to have uh, 1.5 lakh i think we have crossed two okay. so i think you know that's wow. that's a good story mm. and dusra hai uh, the out of pocket jo burden hota hai healthcare ka mm. uh, usko reduce karne ke liye just ayushman bharat the you know publicly financed health insurance policy which was for the bottom uh, two quintiles so bottom 40% ke liye tha but there is of course talk of uh, expanding it and so on uh, that has been a phenomenal i think uh, policy because you you know india has actually managed to reduce out of pocket health expenditure what does that mean it means you know for every rupee which is spent on healthcare how m- how many paisa comes out of a a person's pocket okay right so it used to be around 67% uh, 10 years back so which meant ki out of 1 rupee almost 67 paise are funded by to, my own pocket yes today that number is down to 45% wow so it's a big change right it's a big change um and it's only going to get better because uh, um you know the health insurance of course is an issue but jan aushadi the fact that generic drugs are available at very very reasonable prices locally um so there is a push to making public health better but i think we are also now seeing healthcare as an engine of growth mm. which means dekho world economy age kar raha hai mm. the richer countries are all aging and aging very fast and they're all looking for ways and means to reduce the cost mm. because they're spending dispro- they're spending large amounts of money like us spends 18% on healthcare the biggest economy in the world how much it is spending similarly a lot of these oecd countries which are aging and age related jo expenses hain wo bahut badh rahe ab to get a handle on the cost they're all looking for uh, help right and for us it's a huge growth opportunity chahe wo human resource mein ho so it's not just doctors and nurses there are all kinds like health it is a very specialized uh, part of it uh, if you think of device medical devices hue drugs hue so healthcare now has to be seen as an engine of growth and wo bhi thoda shift aaya hai the pandemic again has uh, help us help us think of ourselves not just as receivers of we you know we manufacture tremendous amounts of vaccine the fact that 70% of global vaccines are produced in india mm. which is not very what very many people sort of know think or appreciate of it. yeah but think yeah. of it yeah. as an emerging market and a, a country which is low middle income country to have and build that kind of infrastructure and capability mm. strategically is huge So I think um, uh, we we I think Ayushman Bharat um, new education policy for the long term growth fundamental. Cool. So my final question: um, How do you respond to again uh, a narrative, a public perception uh, that the current government does not engage with the researchers or the academic? community uh, as much as say any other government would do um and and then what is your message to the science community around this and what's the truth behind you know such a conception or probably a misconception well um i'll tell you there has not been as much 
push on STEM mm. as in the last 10 years. I mean, there have been policies after policies. And STEM is? STEM is when you look at science, technology, engineering, math, and so on, even for women. Uh, in fact, India has a very large number of women in STEM compared to other markets elsewhere. So science is part of it. One is the training. The second is the research part of it. Uh, the setting of the, uh, the National Science uh, Foundation, the Research Foundation, etc. You know, there is a lot of resources getting allocated to improving experimentation and improving research. And also getting academia and industry and government to work together. Because that is the new age and that is, that is the future. A lot of these things have happened only in the last 10 years, right? So, um, in fact, if you go to any of the engineering colleges, uh, they are a relatively more happy bunch. Uh, simply on account, if you look at the number of patents filed, and they're all doing phenomenally well. Uh, state support is a very large part of that because a lot of research is, uh, you know, there's no obvious revenue model around the fundamental part of the research. So it's a public good. Government funds it, government supports it. And there is a great deal of that happening. Yes, we are not a South Korea, mm. which means, you know, we're not investing enough. We don't have enough people into research. But that's a core constraint that we are working around, mm. right? We want, an, you know, more and more people in research. We also want a lot of our thinkers and uh, people to come back. So there is a lot of uh, thinking and sort of policies being thought through on that count, just reversing the brain drain and so on. Um, but if you look at... Um, uh, you know, the wider university uh, setups. Uh, you know, the younger students, uh, they are actually, um, um, you know, amongst, uh, across states, I would say. There is a great uh, degree of optimism if you consider the startup space. Uh, I often joke that when I went to college, all cool kids had guitars. Mm. And now the cool kids have uh, startups, startups <laughs> yes. right? So it's a different world today. And a lot of it has been possible through, um, uh, you know, policy uh, initiatives and also by recognizing that sometimes you want to keep the government out of their hair and, and, and make the processes simple and support and, you know, the concept of incubation, etc. So, you know, it's a, it's a good time. Uh, it can be great. And I think that is the promise of uh, what we are trying to do in the next uh, 24 years, 25 years. That therefore the whole concept around Amrit Kal, that we are a young country, we have to harness the potential of this young, dynamic uh, youth population. Mm. Um, and wo demographic dividend ke liye, mujhe, I mean, humme bhi invest karna padega. We will have to, uh, from a policy perspective, because the youth are there. I mean, they are the ones who are going to build this. And drive the you know. way forward. Absolutely. Yeah. So before we wrap up, uh, since this is a podcast and I've been talking to an economist who's within the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. You're, of course, very active on social media. Not as active as many people would want me to be. Achha, okay. I'm really only on Twitter. I don't understand yeah. Instagram. Yep. I'm not on Facebook. But, mm. uh, but um, from your experience, what's, again, your advice to a lot of scientists, economists, other researchers, public health, public policy researchers, how can they utilize social media to better translate science to people? You know, that's a, that's a very important, I know it's a, it's a sort of end of the, but it's a very important question, Ananya. It's not something we train very well in. It's not something we do very well of either. You see, as researchers, we are good in writing the papers and getting the publications, but then eventually we get read by 10 peers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, social media is about communicating uh, difficult ideas, but within a limited word limit, right? Which means communication skills is what is required at that point. It is not really the the idea itself, right? The threshing of the ideas. Um, I would suggest and I would strongly advise younger researchers, younger scholars to spend a little bit of, invest a little bit of their time and energy into uh, one translational research, so uh, where you, you actually apply it or you have something uh, definitive to say in the form of application, uh, which goes towards policy making. I think in policy making, abstract ideas or theoretical um, uh, work has limited use. So it's application and therefore translational has much more obvious appeal. But a lot of ideas have to be socialized. Mm. It's not enough for you to just speak to the government institutions and the people within the government to enact or implement uh, a new idea. 
within a democracy, you also have to socialize the ideas, mm. right? And which means that you have to grow uh, the currency of the idea uh, amongst the wider audience as well. Uh, it's very important to speak to media. Uh, again, um, um, journalists aren't always the most invested or, yeah. uh, you know, they typically don't do research. They don't read research. Yeah. And that becomes a point of uh, uh, um, frustration. Uh, that, you know, you wish people would just read the papers, mm. uh, but people don't. That is a reality that you have to accept and invest in communicating it. It helps. It truly helps. Right. So I think on that note, I hope that this episode has also been a small attempt to translate developmental economics to people. And, and I hope that we've learned, uh, you know, quite a few things from here and, uh, we look forward to hearing from you on social media and hopefully some of us will read your papers on what does the India story look like. Thank you so much for joining us Thank today. You, Thank, Thank you, Anandi. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all for joining us on this insightful episode of the NIJ podcast with Ananya. As you saw, we had the privilege of delving into the world of economics, data and development with Dr. Shamika Ravi. We explored key developmental issues in India hopefully demystified macroeconomics and gained a deeper understanding of India's true story, India's growth story. We hope this episode has shed light on the complex world of economics and inspired you to think objectively, use data and evidence to understand how is India really changing. So stay tuned for more such engaging conversations on NIJ Podcast with Ananya.